congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I know that time is tight, so I'm going to dive right in. My stuff down here. Um, so, Rebecca, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, you spoke so eloquently, I thought, at the introduction about Nella Larson, about this work. Um, maybe, if you don't mind, please share why this novel, this author, this subject matter spoke to you and led you down the path of this adaptation to the screen. I know it's a lot. But it, it's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try and abbreviate it. Um, it was a time in my life when I was spending more time in America. My mother's from Detroit. My father's British, obviously. Um, yeah, someone laughed, exactly. <laughs> uh, there were rumors in my family that my mother, that her family, who I didn't really know, um, that her father, there was a mystery surrounding his identity. Hmm. Some days it was maybe he is, as you know, as members of my family would put it. Sometimes maybe he was Native American. Maybe he was, maybe he was a little bit black. We don't know. Hmm. I always looked at my mother and I, I thought she's almost definitely a black woman. <laughs> hmm. But there was little confirmation. There was little discussion around it. There wasn't many people I could ask. The only thing I really could do or had the power to do was talk about it more to people. And in talking about it to people and saying, you know, I think there's this thing in my history, somebody handed me a book and said, this might help you understand what's going on here. And, you know, it sounds kind of silly, but I had no context for this. I had no history. You'd be surprised out of the black community how little people even know what the word passing is or that it was something that could happen or did happen. Or And I w was one of those people. I didn't have any context. And I read this book and it hit me like a train in my gut. It was like, oh, of course this was what my grandfather did. Of course these, this was the th these were the things that he had, the choices that he had to make, the sacrifices. And also it made me think about what the legacy on family dynamics are when a life is lived in hiding and what's passed on and where you end up with me and how I feel about that. And also, when I read the book, I felt like I was sitting on, I was like, this book is 93 pages long. It is short. It's this tiny little slim thing. And it sort of telegraphs that it's about racial passing. But then she uses it as a, as a metaphor for everything. <laughs> it suddenly becomes every possible way in which the things that we believe passionately about or we think we believe in, how they don't match up with our desires. You know, if you think of identity or um, anything around this stuff as the sort of, the kind of, the, the meeting point between the story that you tell about yourself and the one that society tells about you, then there's this, you know, Nella Larson is writing about the, the places in the middle of that where Maybe you're not acting out on your desires because you're thinking it's not the right thing to do. And then when you add to that black women living in a system that is overall oppressive, then that capacity to be free is very, it's a whole other thing. You know, the big, the big irony about the book, the big turn about the film, the big surprise is it's not really about the one who's passing. It's the one who pretend, is pretending that she's not who's hiding everything about herself to herself. Yeah. And that, I thought, you know, that was so ahead of its time. It was so, you know, Nella Larson's, we call, we have words like intersectionality now for this stuff, you know, like all the way that all these things meet. And she was doing that in 1929. And nobody got it, by the way. <laughs> Everyone was like, oh, this is just, you know, another one of those stories where people who pass get told off and there's a morally righteous one. 
that's not what's going on. They're missing the whole, there's a whole thing. There's, there's so much to it. Um, so for all of those reasons, I was just like, I, I, you know, immediately I was like, I have to make a movie about it. So I'm just waffling now. Stop me. You've let got, me, you've let me ask more you time. a follow-up. Let me ask you a follow-up. <laughs> this, this is really um, striking. When identity speaks to us, it can be both illuminating, I feel seen, but it can also be scary. I don't want to be seen. I don't know how to be seen. So I, I can only guess that those might have been things that you were thinking about as you dove into this. So how well, did absolutely. you navigate? How did you? How did you navigate? It can be restrictive being told that this is the 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 sum total of what you are, and I think that's what that's also what she's writing about. You know, nobody is nobody is one thing, and we're also busy making categories of everyone and putting everyone into specific boxes and not you know not to be too nail on the head about it but that's why it's in four three i literally put them in a box you know <laughs> it's you know i was about squeezing and like making them feel bound um yeah i'm gonna stop talking now so okay so let's yeah no thank <laughs> stop you stop talking <laughs> thank you rebecca um tessa ruth andre Congratulations, first of all. Thanks. So a two-part question for each of you, building on what Rebecca was just talking about. If you don't mind sharing something about when you, Matt, take yourself back to when you first read this whether the book or the script. Um, if you don't mind sharing something with us that, that leapt out at you, what was something, what's something that you still hold on to that leapt out at you the first time you encountered this writing? And building on that, maybe an early conversation you had either with each other or with Rebecca as you were sort of embarking on this work together. Um, right. Um, well, I think, I think, um, I was so struck by how, um, witnessed I felt reading Passing, to be honest, and Quicksand, her other book. Um, and I fell completely in love with both Irene and Claire because I firmly believe that they're two sides of the same coin and like um we've we've talked about it as well and um um both women have elements of an Ella in them they must do she understands them so completely and wonderfully um I fell in love with Claire because I was jealous of her <laughs> I was jealous of her abandon her joie de vivre her um her refusal to be anything but herself you know um, I think that's extraordinary, especially for a woman of color at that time, you know. Um, and I, I think I find in Claire, I, I don't know, I just sense that there was a bit of um, the misfit um, in her that I think the energy, kind of energy Nella must have had, you know. Um, so I, I just, um, I just fell in love with her writing. What was the other question? Maybe an early an early conversation that you and Rebecca had as you were embarking on this work together. Hmm. One of you take over. Clearly had no I'm conversations. <laughs> <laughs> we had conversations. I just said yeah. Fair enough. She said you want to dance, and I said yeah. You're asking. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna warn you. I have a I have a frog in my throat. Something you know, which is terrifying in the time of COVID. You're just like, please don't cough, please don't cough. But I get tested every 30 minutes, so I assure you, <laughs> I'm negative with a positive attitude. <laughs> The whole movie, I was like, oh, tic tac. Um, <laughs> I, uh, and to that point, um, 
I, I just want to thank everyone for being here because I know it's not easy. Um, and we made this before this time uh, and we, you know, premiered at Sundance digitally and we're so excited about it going to Netflix. And also it's really exciting to see this film in this format. So really, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's really like a treat. Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you so much. It's my birthday. Best. And this is the first time I've seen the film in its uh, complete version. So what a gift. Um, thank you so much. Um, what was the question? So either, either, <laughs> either something about the, the, the words on the page, whether the book or the, the oh. script, um, you can take that one, what spoke to you there, or you can share with us a conversation you had with Rebecca early in the process as you were saying yes. Something that really struck me is uh, the viscera of the book and how sensual it is. Um, th like the scene where we first see each other, the Drayton, there's this, I mean, read the book maybe, because it's, yeah, 93 pages, so you, you can do it. And um, <laughs> But it's, there's this passage where she talks about smelling her, like this waft of perfume and she, it just struck me as, yes, so sensual, so deeply sensual. And it interests me that I would be playing the character that has the least access to her sensuality. So I would just get to watch Ruth do that. And how dazzling is she? Um, <laughs> Um, I was, I was beguiled by the characters. So I read the, the book first and then Rebecca's screenplay, which, what a task, you know, to have this source material that's important and slim and to figure out a visual, you know, way to articulate the interiority of these characters, particularly Irene, who feels a lot and says little of it. Um, and I was just so struck by how well you did that, Rebecca. And we talked, uh, something that, that was fun to do is to talk about the different interpretations, I think, of the book in general, but Irene, her actions, her desires, and... Um, what I liked about your approach so much is that you left space for ambiguity. And oftentimes, you know, people want you to decide exactly what you are, how you feel about something. And I don't like to do that all the time. So <laughs> I think the space for ambiguity, the privilege of ambiguity, um, especially in characters and as a woman of color so rarefied, so we spoke about that, and uh, and our conversations haunted me as much as the book. As far as early conversations, the thing that comes to mind for me is the, the idea you pointed to earlier, Rebecca, around everyone in the film passing in some way, uh, and Brian being a guy who you know outwardly has has a successful life. He's a successful doctor, a father, a, a um, pretty good husband, I think, <laughs> trying to be anyway. Um, and yet he's sitting with uh, an enormous uh, dissatisfaction and restlessness and is in a way passing for happy. Um, so that was really interesting to me. And mostly I'm just grateful to be a part of this. It's, uh, it's really special and y'all are so special. So thank you for bringing me along for the ride. Um, Rebecca, we're here in New York, obviously, and, and when we when I saw this film virtually at Sundance from my living room, um, I immediately emailed my colleagues and said, we have to do everything we can to bring this film to this screen. And there was hope in that statement because we didn't even know if we'd be able to do this here like we're doing tonight. Um, but one of the things I was thinking about um, when I saw the film, beyond everything that you've all just shared, now is also this idea of New York as a character, as 
such a strong presence that that carries us and holds us in this film. So um, I have to ask you to talk about New York. We're at the New York Film Festival. Welcome back. Thank you for bringing this film to New York. Yeah. Well, no. Thank you for thank you for hosting it. I, you know, it's a slightly um, um, contrary response to that question because I was quite interested in not really showing it in a kind of typical way. Um, I think people think about the twenties and they immediately think jazz age and everything's loud and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, but this is kind of, you know, this is all drawing rooms and teacups and politeness and restraint. And, and we need to see New York through Irene's restraint, sort of uptight eyes, <laughs> you know? And so I, I wanted to find a way to feel on the peripheries of the jazz age and the noise and the bustle, like she's sort of not quite in it. Um, and so I was always, you know, we, that said, it was crucial to shoot in Harlem, <laughs> you know, and I if think for the, the context, thank you. Yeah. And the, yeah, you know, the history and just the feel and, and we were in a, a real brownstone on the real streets and that, that was important to me, to everybody. And to have that as our sort of home base, as it were, um, I think gave me freedom to be delicate about how to drip feed the other elements of the period and the 20s and all mm -hmm. the rest of it and New York City. A lot of it was sound, honestly. Yeah. Well, so so I want to get to the technical uh, in the time that we have left. And you referenced it earlier, the idea of making a film in black and white in this aspect ratio, all the, all the things that might be seen from the outside world as a hurdle or an obstacle um, are all choices, decisions that as a filmmaker you made and that all collectively create the experience we just had. Um, so if you could maybe elaborate on some of the the ways you were, th you thought you talked about the box, putting the characters in the box, but also the black and white and the sound, the design, the music. There's a lot there, and we don't have a lot of time, but I want to see if which which I of those you want to sort of. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for briefly us. to the black and white because it's kind of, I, you know, it's glaringly obvious. Um, I I knew from I think like the the first draft of the screenplay, which I wrote ten days after reading the book, that it had to be in black and white. Um, not so much because of the obvious reasons, like it's a film about people and across the color line. That's not really it. It was more the abstraction of it that interested me. Like, you know, this is this is about the in-between spaces and the things that are not black and white. And the, the big gag about black and white is it's actually gray. <laughs> um, you know, it's not black and white. <laughs> Similarly, people aren't black and white. They're, we're both undergoing a process of translation with our eyes when we do those things. So I just wanted to draw attention to how busy we are categorizing. Um, also, I'm not particularly interested in, in cinematic reality reflecting our reality. I think it's imperative that there is emotional truth but I'm interested in poetry and I'm interested in trying to make people feel things in an expressionistic sort of way. And I felt that the black and white put people in a, a slightly abstracted space where the world had its own rules and the shade and the tone could shift people. It draws attention to, I guess, the slippery reality of these things that we're talking about, like that people are changeable <laughs> in this way. And you could see it with black and white. I mean, there are, and for example, in the, in the hotel room at the beginning, it's very purposefully oversaturated with light and, and whiteness. Mm. Um, you know, everyone is blown out. It's oppressively light. And then when you get to Harlem, it's a completely different lighting scape. And those those choices were very purposeful. And purposeful because for, for very straightforward reasons, it was crucial to me to cast black women in these roles. There is a history of passing movies in Hollywood. They're nearly always white women or white men with a few very rare exceptions like Freddie Washington. 
it didn't feel right to me. It didn't feel like it was going to put you in the position of experiencing it correctly. I wanted you to experience it from a black perspective, honestly. Mm. You know, if, if a, a family member goes and, you know, leaves and starts passing white, that family doesn't look at that person and think, you know, oh, they're white. <laughs> they will always see them as black. So I wanted the audience to look at people that you know, that you have a fixed idea about the, their identity. You look at Tessa Thompson and Ruth Negger and you, you know them to be black women. That puts you into that perspective and it makes it scary because you're thinking, what's going on? Are they going to, are they going to get found out? I'm terrified. What, how is anyone, how is no one seeing this? You know, and that, I, I needed you to feel that. And there was a, there was, the black and white allowed me that, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> really? Like, yeah. uh, Andre, Ruth, Tessa, Rebecca, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.